listening to I Am Refocused Radio with your host, Shamaya Reed. This show is designed to inspire you to live your purpose and regain your focus. And now, here's your host, Shamaya Reed. Hey, welcome to I Am Refocused Radio. We are here once again. And today, just like any other day, we have another show lineup for y'all. We have our special guest. We're going to be talking about, you know... The hottest topic right now, AI, artificial intelligence. Well, guess what? We have an expert on artificial intelligence, Jonathan Green. He has an amazing website that you can go to. is servnomaster.com. We're going to learn everything about his entrepreneurship and a little bit about his story. Quick snapshot, he's a best-selling author of ChatGPT Profits. Man, he hosts this amazing podcast as well that we can dive into a little bit later. He has a massive mailing list with over 100 thousand plus subscribers man i only have ten thousand subscribers myself i made me have ten i'm joking but first and foremost man we have jonathan on the show how you doing today man i'm doing good i'm excited to be here thank you so much for having me i appreciate your time man so kind of tell us a little bit about your journey uh, i understand based on your information you went full-time online business owner uh back in february 2010 what sparked that uh light bulb to come on for you I got fired. Like a lot of people, I had dabbled, kind of trying stuff on the side, playing around, one toe in the water, but I never really thought that I was an entrepreneur. Because you always hear these people that are like, they have these stories of like, oh, I was doing this in high school and this when I was in college. And like they were an entrepreneur the whole time, starting businesses and succeeding from a really young age. And I never really saw myself that way. I always saw myself as like, oh, I'll mess around and make a little money on the side, but I'm not an inventor. I'm not an entrepreneur. And we don't really learn about that in school. You know, we just kind of learn how to be an employee. So you almost have to find your own way to entrepreneurship. So I just probably never would have done it except for getting fired. And I just said, I don't want to feel like this ever again. And you are helping entrepreneurs all around the world. You are, like I said, expertise in AI and using these tools that can be tailor made for a business approach to help entrepreneurs escape or just replace that traditional nine to five revenue with a AI driven income. Can I explain to the audience what you have discovered using artificial intelligence and how that can position them to do great things? So the barriers to starting your own business have been going down for the past 30 or 40 years. Like when I was a kid and you want to start your own business, you would go, you'd write down a business plan, go to the bank, ask for a loan of $25,000 based on that business plan and then start open a store or start like a physical business. And that's really what I grew up under, right? In the eighties and nineties. And then since then, then the barrier got lowered more and more when you could have just a website and start a business from your website. And then it was even more, you could start a business just from social media. And what's happened with the AI revolution is the barrier to entry has dropped even more because now you don't really need technical proficiency. You don't need to learn how to code. You don't need to learn how to do a lot of those additional skills more and more you don't have to learn how to edit video because an ai will do it you don't have to learn how to edit your podcast and ai will do it you don't have to learn how to edit photos so the old excuses or the barriers of oh i'm not technical i don't know how to do that i have time to learn how to do those have kind of gone away so it's really the playing field is getting more and more even so the beauty of right now is that it's still fresh ai is still new 90 percent of people still don't use ai on a daily basis it's very rare just people into it think that everyone's using it but it's not true so there's this opportunity right now for people who want to dabble in entrepreneurship you no longer need to hire people so i went from having 20 employees now i just have two and that's really they handle just some repetitive tasks mostly they're managing my ai software they're kind of going in and just running the programs so it saves me a huge amount of time and allows you to save that additional hurdle. So it doesn't take as much of your time. And now you don't have to hire and manage a bunch of employees, which has always been the scaling hurdle in the past, really to go from six figures to seven figures, you had to start hiring and that's not there anymore. You can now get really far with AI tools. Most of my work is done by AI now. I very rarely do a task without using any AI and it's so much faster than anything I was doing in the past. And the key word you said was managing those AI tools. Now let's dig deeper into that because it's one thing for someone to have all the bells and whistles in the kitchen. But it's another thing if you actually know how to bake the cake, have a a recipe for success for you. How did you kind of navigate that journey of finding a good system that worked with 
using AI as a way to, like you said, make things kind of get done at a faster pace? Yeah, it just started with a lot of research. So I noticed that a lot of AI tools kind of make the same promises. So I started to sift through them and play around with a lot of things. And I look for tools that match how I think or that seem intuitive to me. So there are tools that other people love that I hate because they just don't feel natural to me. And as I began kind of my journey, I realized a lot of tools are using the same backend. So for example, most tools that do transcription, they're actually using the same software. Uh, there's only two or three transcription algorithms. One of them is from Google and there's two other ones. So most of the time when a software is a transcription software, they're just using the same backend. So two different companies at different prices are giving the same result. And it's the same thing for most writing tools. 99% of AI writing tools are just using ChatGPT's API from OpenAI. So they're the same tool, but they're charging more money. I've seen tools charging as much as a couple hundred dollars a month for what from ChatGPT would be $20 a month. So, and you get less features. So that was the first part of the journey, kind of realizing that it's a, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors. There's a lot of tools out there that are not actually AI tools and say that they are. They're faking it or they just put it in the name because it means you're worth more. People will pay more money for a stock if they have AI in the name of the business and people will pay more for a software if they put AI at the end of it. And I've seen a lot of companies doing this and it's a distraction. So just doing a lot of research, I just realized that since everything is built on the same, you know, ChatGPT's API, they're built using ChatGPT in the back end. Maybe I just can go straight to ChatGPT and learn that. So that's where I really started. And then from there, I just watched all of these training videos and I'm watching them and going, you know what? I think I can do this, but I, I think I could do this better than the person in the video. I have some ideas. And that's why I kind of began innovating. Someone listening to this right now, they're an entrepreneur or maybe they work nine to five and they have a side hustle or they have a full-blown company. We're using artificial intelligence, let's use chat GPT as an example. It's one thing just to randomly type a prompt and have a wishful thinking of a genie that all of a sudden you're gonna have this massive wealth because of this magical prompt that you made. It's a little bit deeper than that. What was some practical uh, steps that you used to kind of tweak your prompts to where it actually serves you versus like, I'm just kind of like jumping the ocean, hoping I get lucky. So you want to start from someone else's ideas. That's the best place to, to do it. That's what I did. So there's no onboarding with any of these tools. And that's because they're using their customers as guinea pigs. So they want to see what you do. And that's how they train the model, which is great for them. But it's kind of bad for the user experience because there's no instruction manual. There's no starting point. There's no test prompt. So what I recommend, and this is the best thing to do. So the first step is to switch it into interrogative mode, which is a really fancy way of saying you have to give any AI permission to ask you questions. So the way AI is trained is that it thinks one question at a time. It never expects you to ask a second question and always thinks I have to answer this question in the amount of time provided. So it's almost like someone on a quiz show, right? You're a guest on a quiz show. You have to answer the question in 30 seconds. Even if you don't know the answer, they're not going to give you an additional 30 seconds. So it's in this kind of perpetual state of performance. But you can switch it out of that mode by saying something along the lines of, I want to do this. This is my goal, right? I want to design the perfect customer avatar or I want to create show notes for today's podcast episode. So you give it your goal. And the second half of the prompt is you just give it permission to ask you questions. Say, what information do you need from me in order to accomplish this task? And what you've done is two things that are important. You've told it, one, there's going to be more than one prompt. We're going to have a conversation. And two, you've given it permission to ask you for the information it needs. So the reason most people, in fact, 99 or more percent of people struggle is that they think I have to give the AI commands. And so I have to guess at the command. By right. switching it into this interrogative mode, you remove that pressure for you to be the genius and allow the AI to be the genius. Because now instead of guessing what information it needs from you or what command it needs, it will just tell you. And this removes all of the problems most beginner users have. And it's really the easiest way to get started. You'll notice a massive change because 
now it knows which model to activate. So most AIs are actually multiple different AIs behind one interface. So there might be one that's like a math expert, one that's a writing expert, one that's a science expert, one that's a history expert, all hidden behind it. And it's figuring out which one to activate based on your question. So by saying what your goal is right out the gate, it knows which AI to activate rather than possibly switching between backends as you ask different questions. So this is going to give you a significantly better, more targeted result and give you the result a lot faster. We're talking to our guest, Jonathan Green. You, like I said earlier, you can go visit his website, servnomaster.com. We're talking about AI today, artificial intelligence. And I like what you said because I just had the visual of, you know, you have a tennis ball, you hit the ball, you know, across the net, but it doesn't return. <laughs> That's like bad prompts. And I like how you, you know, broke it down where you can almost basically have a discussion with AI. You know, it's where you're just nearing down to your goal. And let's touch on that because when it comes to goals as, you know, 95 or, or side hustler or whatever your, you know, your position is right now, listen to this podcast. How important is it for you to identify the end game? So that way you have at least an idea the direction you're heading. Yeah. So the most important thing is to really leverage your time, especially when you're already working a full-time job. So if you're working a full-time job or part-time and you're just starting to get into building your online business. That's one of the big waypoints. And the second one is when you quit your job. A lot of people quit their jobs because their side business is going well and they're doing well working two hours a day. And suddenly they have eight hours or 10 hours a day and their efficiency drops to the floor because they go, oh my gosh, I have so much time. I don't have any more pressure. I can take it slow and you get less done and more time. So these two big waypoints, the first lesson is how do I be, how do I achieve efficiency? And that's a fancy word to say. It's like, I hate when people say they're efficiency experts. I'm like, what does that mean? Right. So let me get specific, which is look at any task you do that's repetitive. That's the first place I start. So any task that's repetitive for me, I go, how can I do this faster using AI? So for example, um, with my podcast, my podcast is a video podcast. After I record an episode, right, we have to clean up the audio. We have to add in the commercials and the intro music and have it go back and forth showing whoever's talking on screen to get that final video file that we can upload. So that whole process used to take a really long time. Um, I had two different people working on it full time. So I said, you know what, is there an, now there's an AI that will handle the, there's actually two different AIs. I was using one, then using the other that does the flipping back and forth. Just, oh, just show the camera to whoever's talking, right? And it sounds simple, but it wasn't doable until just like the last few months. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that, okay, the audio comes out, but it's never as good as you want, right? Like you always have to process it. I never like the sound of my own voice. So I used to have to do that manually, right? I mean, went to school for sound engineering. So I'm very familiar with it. It's a whole process. You listen to it multiple times to find the perfect settings for my voice, but that's not the perfect settings for the guest voice. So it takes this huge amount of time. Well, now there's actually three different tools I can test. I could just drop the audio file in and push enhance and then choose which one sounds the best. Then I re-add it to the video. And then I just drop in the three commercials or the intro music, outro music, and it's done. So now editing the podcast takes me of my own personal time, 15 minutes. Total. The rest of the time is that time you spend when you're waiting for like the file to, file to process, right? Like it's rendering, it's converting to video. The next part of the process that used to take a really long time, and I went through several iterations with this, is creating the show notes. So first, I would just pay someone to do it, right? Words I did it myself and it just took too much time. It would take me like an hour to do show notes per episode because I have to go back and re-listen to the episode. Then I hired someone and it was just it's expensive, right? Paying someone for two hours of their time every single episode. And they charge, the longer the episode, the more they charge you, that adds up. So then as I'm dealing with that, I started looking at, is there a way to get an AI to do this? Now I've created a process where I say, here's an example of my, what I want my show notes to look like to the AI. I say, here's an example. Here's the transcript of an episode. Make show notes for the new episode that look like these old show notes. So you have the format of the template. And now it takes me what used to take me a couple hours right now. It takes me one minute. It's just copying and pasting that in and then copying and pasting the answer out into the new document. 
So these repetitive processes, I've now moved off my plate, but it's also things that could be a smaller repetitive process. I always get, and this is something that happens to me all the time. I always get these lists and there's like numbers at the front of the list or something that I just want to remove and I have to manually remove the number at the front of each list. Now I can drop that list into like chat GPT and say, hey, give me the list back but without the numbers at the front. So it's like this thing that might take me 10 minutes, but now it doesn't take me that 10 minutes. So it could be a small task or a big task, but anything you're doing every week that's repetitive is the first thing that you try and move to an AI. It's the same thing with like answering comments or posting to social media. AI can help you to be more efficient with that, right? Because maybe the hard part for you is coming up with ideas. It's great for coming up with ideas. So sometimes um, what I'll find is an article, like a news article. Oh, this is interesting. I, w- I would want to write a social media post about this topic or tweet about it. Now I could just feed it to my Twitter bot and I'll say, hey, give me 10 tweets based on this post and I'll choose the ones I like. By doing that, I get, I came up with the idea, but now turning that into tweets, I get 10 with all the emojis and stuff I can just choose from. So I'm still heavily involved, but it saves me a massive amount of time. I don't have to read the whole article. I just know the article has the content I want and it can build from that. So those are some of the ways that you can start to push those repetitive processes instead of to an employee now to an AI process. I like what you're talking about because uh, using chat GPT myself, uh, not at the level you're using it, other AI tools, but one thing I've been doing, like you mentioned about uh, removing numbers from a list. Well, I've been doing it for like, you know, creating keywords from people's bios and then listing the keywords with commas so I can just copy and paste when I post a podcast, you know, on my, my uh, platform. And stuff like that saves time, you know, like within a f- couple minutes, that task is already done. You know, I can, I can restructure uh, someone's bio to sound a certain tone. You know, you know, you can write samples of how you would write something and have, you know, chat G- GPT, like learn how, your style and your tone. You can implement it for, you know, new prompts. So it's, it's massive what you can do with AI. When you look at uh, the opportunities that you get to use your platform to share these, you know, golden, golden nuggets, because people can read the book, chat uh, GPT profits on Amazon. You have a little gift, man. Like people can read this right now for free. How long is, is there a limit to that? Or because I believe uh, you can get it on Kindle for a price, but right now you have unlimited reading. So tell us a little bit about that on Amazon. Yeah, it's part of the Kindle Unlimited program, which is like Amazon. If you pay ten or eleven dollars a month, I'm a customer of it too. It lets you just do unlimited reading of any book that's opted into the program. Mm. So if you're a member of that, then it's like you can just grab it easy. It's the same thing. It's on Audible as well. I think that if you're a member of different Audible things, you can get the audiobook for free. Um, I don't. I'm not a member of Audible. I use a different subscription service. So I'm not a hundred percent sure on how that one works, but I put it in as many places as possible to make it as available as possible, mostly because I got really frustrated with a lot of the other books out there because they have a lot of prompts in them that don't work. And I could tell the books had actually been written by ChatGPT because the reviews for the book were written by ChatGPT. And I was like, man, this is very frustrating for me because these books don't work. And it's like, I wasn't sitting there going, you know what the world needs is one more ChatGPT book. But I read that these two books, the two books that were selling really well, and they both were fake. And it really bothered me because Mm -hmm. Someone who's trying to learn how to use this stuff, the last thing you need is an instruction manual that doesn't work. Like, that's not cool. So I felt this impetus to do, to create what I wish existed. And it was a bunch of extra work, but there's just this gap in the market where people are like, well, how do I do these things? And so creating that kind of thing that fills the gap was, is really the purpose of it. It's really meant to be the instruction manual that I wish came with ChatGPT. So it kind of is a list really of all the things that it can do. And then how to do each of those things. So you can go, you know, and I just want to learn how to summarize, or I just want to learn how to write emails, or I just want to learn how to do some social media stuff. So you can just jump to that section and copy and paste my prompt and you can see my prompt and the result I get. So you can see what I said and what ChatGPT said back. And if you listen to the audiobook, I have this amazing narrator who does different voices. So you can tell if it's me or if it's me prompting or if it's the computer talking. It really fills in those spaces. So it's designed to give you everything you need to really get started um, as that perfect instruction manual. So you don't have to go and watch hundreds of hours of YouTube videos like I did to get started. 
And you don't know this because I never met you before, but I've seen your book float around on social media. I believe if I saw it correctly, you uh, published this earlier this year, back in June. Is that right? Yeah, I published it at the beginning of summer, end of May, early June. I can't remember exactly what day it came out, but yeah, that's when I released it. Yeah. Um, I put as fast as possible. So I really tried to get it done in as quickly as possible because the thing about AI stuff is that if things very quickly can go out of date. Yeah. And you had like, like up to date, you have tons of reviews and that's a, always a good sign that uh, you actually have readers that are reading the, the book and co-signing, you know, what you're teaching because this stuff, like you said, is still kind of new. But the biggest problem is one thing that you touched on is that a lot of people are just, they're just using, you know, chat GBT um, written books. And that's not going to cut it. It's almost like someone who has a lot of words that they know and they just throw it in the pot. <laughs> but, but it makes no sense. But you're doing from a different approach. I, I think that's really great for our listeners. Uh, one thing real quick before we let you go. You have a blog on your site that people can go to uh, servenomaster.com. And you, speaking of books, you have a blog post on, on write a book in 30 days. And you really break that down for someone who, you know, may aspire to write their own, you know, professional book in a very organized way. Kind of share with the audience a little bit of some of the details that you go over in the process of, of the writing for someone who might aspire to write their own book. Yeah, the hardest way to write a book is to sit down with a blank piece of paper and a typewriter and start writing, right? To write it in order. We usually, for some reason, we think that books are created in the order that we read them, which is never the case. A lot of books are written out of order or written from the middle outward, which is like first you write an outline, like first you write an idea, then you write an outline, then a bigger outline, then a bigger outline, and then a book. So as soon as you switch to that mode, it removes that pressure of going, oh, I have to come up with everything along the way. I have to write this story by the seat of my pants. So I really try to teach people that you can build a structure and go, okay, let me just start from what's the big idea of my book? What do I want my book to do? So I usually start when I'm working with a client or someone, I was saying, wait, what's the, what's the thing you want someone to think right after they've read your book? What, what do you want them to feel? Or what do you want them to think? What's that one? And I always... I have to really narrow people down to one because a lot of people will say like seven things and they go, it's impossible. You can't do that. You can't make anyone feel seven emotions at once. It just doesn't work that way. People are happy or they're sad or they're angry. They're not all three at the same time. So you have to narrow it down. And that really helps by creating that first thing. It's like, what's your real goal? Then from there, we work backwards and say, okay, well, how do we get from where people are right now at the start of your book to that feeling at the end of the book? And we break it down into pieces. So by starting really big picture and focusing on the goal, and this is the same thing for a fiction book, right? What do you want the reader to do at the end of the book? Usually it's read the next book in the series. So we know we have to end on something that makes them feel a sense of accomplishment, but they want more, right? Like the detective solves the case and then they find out there's another mystery. So that's all goes into the process and then break it down to, well, how much do I have to accomplish per day to get the book done in 30 days? Most people who are writing a nonfiction book can get it done in 30 to 60 minutes a day, Monday to Friday in four weeks. If you have this process in place, it's very doable. And it's because you break it down. Where it fails, where people fail is usually when they violate the process. So they usually either refuse to put in 30 minutes a day. They just don't do it. There's nothing I can do about that, right? If you don't do it, I can't electrocute you or threaten you into doing it, nothing will work. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is that they get caught in paralysis analysis. So sometimes people do like, yeah, I've been working on chapter two for three months. I'm like, just stop working on chapter two, work on chapter three. And um, the people that do the listen to me when I say that succeed and the people that don't fail 100% of the time. So anyone who violates the process and does rewrites when they're supposed to just be doing kind of stream of consciousness, the first rough draft will always fail. So I think it's a hundred percent failure rate. I've never met someone who violated that rule and still succeeded. So you have to treat the rough draft like a rough draft. It's supposed to be rough. Mm, it's yes. supposed to be not good. 
Um, even when I'm ghostwriting and I turn in a rough draft to a client and they go, why is this so rough? I was like, yeah, that's in the name, <laughs> right? I still have to send an email with them saying, this is going to be rough. It hasn't, the grammar hasn't been fixed because why would I edit the grammar and clean up the spelling if you're going to delete that whole chapter, right? And I've had that happen where people are like, I wish you fixed the grammar, but I don't want this chapter anyways. I'm like, well, why would I fix, you know what I mean? Like, why would I spend time doing something? Now with AI, I can have the AI do that for me. So now I do turn in a clean rough draft, but until six months ago, I never did. Yeah. Because it's a rough draft. You're going to move chapters around. You're going to realize you don't like sections. You're going to change the theme. So you have to wait and do things in phases. So the first phase is just to get enough words down that you have the length of a book. Once you have that, the rest of the process is just refining. But a lot of people, if you start refining before you finish getting the words on the page, you're going to get trapped. Yeah. So you, that's really the secret is to just get it down. And then of course, when I teach people how to write, I usually teach dictation. I think dictation now is even more viable than it was before. Cause now with AI, the AI can turn your dictation into the book for you and really create that a better rough draft than just a transcript. So there's a lot more that's possible, but it all starts from kind of process, creating a process, creating a structure going, okay, here's what I'm going to do. And then sticking to that commitment. If you, and you, if you're willing to work seven days a week and just put in one hour a day, you can have a really great book done in 30 days. It's just very hard for people to do something like that. And the reason I make it 30 days is that if I say write a book in six months, no one will do it. We never stick to anything that's like a really long-term goal. We're good at close goals. We're bad at faraway goals. So the shorter a goal is, the better. Like I want to be as close to that goal as possible. And that's what I want to create for people. So there are versions, you know, I have a version where you can write a book in two hours, but you really have to just really hit it hard to do that. Some people go, oh, that's unbelievable. So it's hard to use that number. So if it's too long, people won't do it. If it's too fast, people find it unbelievable. So I find 30 days is very manageable for most people. And a lot of people have written their books by going through that process. So it has been very successful for the people that do it. Man, I mean, if you're hearing this podcast, you already know this guy's the real deal because he ain't sure coding nothing and he's not saying, hey, the genie, make your wish and abracadabra, you, you're you famous and you're rich. No, that's not how it usually works. It's a, it's a grind, it's a process and it's using systems that will work. I like all that that you've been talking about throughout the show. Once again, talking to our guest, Jonathan Green, goes his website, uh, servenomaster.com. Man, we, we barely even touch the surface of all the things you do. Um, Real fast, you have a um, tools section on your website for entrepreneurs out there who can learn even more. I mean, it's crazy. It's not just artificial intelligence. It's like that plus some. Um, you're helping them really tackle tools on social media and just in processes in itself to help them really position building, you know, whatever they're trying to build, whatever, you know, service they're trying to serve or whatever. You're doing it step by step. And I think that's a massive difference between you and the rest of these quote unquote AI professionals. Yeah. I always, one of the things I always do when I visit someone's website, I try and look and see what tools they're using. Just like every time I see someone making good videos, I like want to see what, know what lights they're using, what camera they're using to see if I can change things, what microphone they're using. So I constantly, in fact, I just updated my tools section last week because I was like, oh, some of these tools I don't use anymore or They've kind of, they're shifting out of my focus. So that's what I really look at is what are the things I'm using? Sometimes there's a tool that I used to use that makes more sense for a beginner because what I'm using now is more expensive or more complicated and a lot of beginners don't need it because they're not scaling yet. So I'm always looking for what's the shortest path to usefulness. And it's right now, it's kind of a really cool renaissance because a lot of products have dropped in price because of the AI just the way AI is priced out, it's pushed the price of everything else in the market down. So it's a really good time to be a consumer. And I'm always thinking what's like the right technology for somebody who's what are the right tools? Because there are so many AI tools. I get messaged probably 20 times a week with tools that people want me to review. And I can, I'm always trying to keep up and I never can because there's so many things and some of the tools are really, really big. And it's hours and hours of work. There's a bunch of like, I haven't done all the ones I want to do yet this week because it's like 20 or 30 hours of going through all of these different tools. So it's impossible. So I try and do that so that you don't have to. There's a lot of tools I test that I never talk about because they're not good enough and they're not ready for prime time. 
someone sent me free access to a tool yesterday and then it didn't work. And I was like, okay, so not a good first impression, right? Like I, I created the account, the login account to then test the tool and it cra- the website crashed. I was like, oh man, already, you've, you know what I mean? I don't, I would never share this with someone because they're just going to get stressed out. So oh. I'm looking for things like that. And then eventually maybe that tool will work and it's ready for prime time, but I'm constantly doing that because as a consumer, especially with AI, there's new software, new updates, new changes coming every single day. There's news every day. Like right after we finish recording this, I have to go and probably spend one to three hours just looking at the news for today, just what's happened in the last 12 hours since I checked everything. Because I guarantee you there's been a new product launch that I've never heard of, a product I use is updated, a product that I like has changed its features and I have to keep up with all of that. So there's always things happening that... I have to keep up with. So for someone who it's not their full-time job, it's just mathematically impossible. So I do that so that my followers don't have to. That's good stuff, man. If you're listening right now and you want to be a content creator, author, or some kind of entrepreneur, side hustle, or whatever, full-time, whatever your case is, I suggest you go to servantomaster.com. It's a bold name for a website, but it's a lot deeper than that name or that phrase, if you will. You have a lot of resources for people to tap into. You even have a private Facebook group community so people don't have to be all by themselves, overwhelmed. They can get questions answered. What's the best way someone can get involved in your community and what they should keep in mind so that they can contribute value? Yeah, if you look for chat GPT for entrepreneurs or you can just search on Facebook for Serve No Master and you'll find the group. I wanted to make a place where it's really focused. There's some really big ChatGPT groups, but there's so many posts that are all advertising things and they're all really disparate. There's a lot of information about ChatGPT and AI tools that's interesting, but not useful. So I try to very much streamline and say, this is just for people that want to use it in a business setting. This is not for people that want to use it at school. This is not for people that want to use it as a toy. It's not for people that want to sell their own software. I'm not selling my own software in there. It's really just meant for that one thing where we can share things we've learned, share ideas, um, give away different tools. I'm always giving away things. I developed a new bot inside of ChatGPT that I give away in the group for free now to show people kind of a, a different way of creating. And now I can give you a link and it adds an entire prompt into your dashboard. So I don't have to teach that programming element anymore. Let's go beyond what I shared with you, which is I call my master prompt, right? The prompt where I teach you, tell it what you want, and then ask a question. Now I can actually just push a stronger prompt to you. So I give away this prompt named Cynthia Diamond because it's an entire personality where she's just a content creation expert. She writes blog posts and articles and create content for you really well. And it shows people what's possible. So it's really cool evolution with ChatGPT where now I can give away my, I call them cyber staffers because they're not real people, but they're employees. And I can just push one directly to, from my chat GBT to yours and you can test it out. So I'm always, I just gave that away yesterday in my group. I'm always adding new things and they're giving away new things to give as much value as possible because I want people to really see what an efficient use of the tool is. I don't want you to have to sift through like 500 posts a day to find one useful post. I just want you to get right to, okay, this is what's useful. This is what can help me. And then you get back to your life. We've been talking to our guest, Jonathan Green. You can go to his his website. It's servenomaster.com. We've also been talking throughout the whole show, his his book, Chat GPT Profits. And guess what? He has other books. Just click on the book tab on his website. He has a list of all the books that are available for you to grab. Man, I didn't tend to go uh, long on this interview, but I just feel like I had to because this stuff was like on point. I mean, I learned a lot. I mean, compared to other quote-unquote experts they just be like yeah do this do that but this was more like you in the kitchen you baking good cakes <laughs> you're not just using all these fancy bells and whistle tools like you actually learning how to actually use these tools to make your life better so once again jonathan green thank you for your time thank you for having me it's great to be here